So I've been working on my own indie series in Blender. You can go watch the first episode for free in the description. The whole purpose of this is to face off against actual production, so I run into real world problems and have to find solutions that I can share with you. And that's what this video is. It's a recap of the biggest things condensed that I learned in episode one. If you wanna watch a longer version of this video, it's over on my Patreon, but there should still be plenty of good info. Chapter one, previs. Previs for me is a pretty lightweight process. It basically boils down to two things. One, I'm blocking out the scene to get a general feel of the space. And two, I'm animating my shots and camera so I know how the first person character moves through the space. The block out phase is also a time to reevaluate the script. A nice thing about solo indie production is I can move back and forth between production steps pretty easily. I can't really talk about blocking out my shots without getting into the actual animation technique I use. In this case, I'm using a first person camera technique. This is meant to feel like a gameplay video, as if this is an actual first person game. To get that effect, I turn on record in the timeline, play the timeline, then with the camera selected and in the camera view, I hit shift tilde, that's just under the escape key, to enter fly mode and then press tab to enable collision and gravity. This way I could just walk around my space like it's an actual video game. After the action, I'll bake the spaces in between so I have a keyframe every frame and I'll smooth things out a bit. When I need to do something secondary like having the character sit down or open a door, I animate all of that in a secondary pass. So for example, I have my camera animation done and I add an empty to the scene, parent my camera to that empty, and then I can animate the empty to do something like sit down. Same with environment objects like the fridge door. I just animate that to open and the drinks disappearing as a secondary animation pass after the first live recording is done. If you want to see something a bit more advanced, like how I parented the camera temporarily to my elevator to get it seamlessly to a lower level, then you should go check out my Patreon. For at least $3 USD a month, you can get access to every quick tip video, training, or longer course that I put out. Chapter 2, Environment Creation. I got into all the camera stuff because I actually do work out most of my shots before I even start on the environment. Like I mentioned, the reason for that is so that I don't waste time making parts of the environment really fleshed out that I'll never actually see. So my environment starts with grabbing a quick viewport rendering of the scene so far and taking some notes about which areas are key to the story and what kind of props I need. If it's a hero prop, meaning it's close up to the camera and I'm interacting with it, then I'll spend some time modeling it in Blender. I use a traditional sub-D modeling approach for a lot of things, but I also get away with as much quick and dirty work as I can, too. Deciding how much time you put into making something with clean topology really comes down to a decision about what the prop is, how it's used in the sequence, and how clean or dirty it is. I do recommend you learn how to model things properly, learn sub-D modeling, and get some skills under your belt. Like with all things though, if you really understand the rules and why they're there, then you understand when to break them without compromising your scene. A lot of what was down in the mine was pretty rough geometry. I did this because I knew much of what I saw down there would be grainy drone footage with everything covered in dirt. In fact, I only rendered this section out at 50% the resolution of the final of the rest of the episode, just to save time. My top priority is always to finish a shot. The reality is I don't finish if I lean on the crutch of perfection. To me, it's an excuse to get scared and stop working. If I'm having a hard time sitting down to work, I commit myself to making a really terrible prop, throw it in the background, and from there, everything feels a bit easier to make. I can always revisit something ugly after I have some momentum. Chapter three, textures. Textures are primarily procedural in my work. For that, I use a must-have paid add-on called Fluent Materializer. I don't recommend a lot of add-ons, but this is absolutely one that'll come up all the time. Fluent comes with a handy end panel menu where you can browse some pre-made procedural noises and other layering elements. It also has a pie menu when you press F for Fluent. Here we have a lot of great masking tools like cavity or edge masks. 
These are complex node groups all contained within convenient packages you can use for various layer techniques. For example, let's say I have a base texture that's made up of primarily photo textures. From here, I can interrupt my base color with a mixed color node. I can plug the same image from A to B, but for B, I can interrupt that with a hue saturation value node. I can lower the value, and for the factor, the bit that decides what's A and what's the darker B, I can use the fluent cavity node. Now I have a darker color in the cavity areas. Same principle for roughness variation, edge masks, metallic. It's all just using edge and cavity here in Fluent. I can even add some texture variation to the mask. It doesn't stop at cavity and edge masking though. We also get a nice gradient grunge or drip maps that really help tie an entire scene together. For example, we can have a mixed shader node at the end of an entire texture setup to this, we'll add a bit of a grungy, dirty material. We'll also add a bit of this in the cavities. To be subtle here is key, so I'll use a map range to dial back the effect. From here, I can group this into a neat little node group. Nothing is stopping us from copying and pasting that node group all around the scene to further solidify the effect that all these props belong in the same environment. If nothing else, procedural texture techniques are a great way to cover a lot of ground quickly as well as tie everything together. Chapter 4, Lighting and Rendering. Something I use all over the place in this episode were spotlights. Spotlights are a great way to carefully light a scene with very intentional areas of light and shadow. Just straight spotlights can look a bit uniform and sometimes fake. Something I used a lot here were light textures from the light texture pack on my Patreon, something you get access to as a subscriber. Within the last version of Blender, they've simplified the process of adding image textures to your light. Now it's as simple as dragging and dropping the texture to use or the image to use as strength or even color. From here, I can work with the radius and the angle to make things cover a wider area or to be a harder or softer light source. This is exactly what these light textures are made for, a quick way to add subtle but powerful variation to visually break up the lighting in a scene. It's the same thing I used for the flashlight. I just parented one of those spotlights with a texture to the camera itself. For render optimizations, I suggest you check out another training I posted recently where I take an environment from episode two in my series and I get the render time down from eight minutes to under five seconds per frame. Lots of good tips in that one. If you're like me, you have old hardware and you don't really wanna spend money on upgrading your workstation. That's it for this one. Thanks for the support. Tell your friends and I'll see you in the next.